Okay, I uh, think we can get started. Uh, so thank you for once again tuning in uh, and taking your time uh, to join us today. Uh, so we're going to get started. I'm going to try and have a quick one. I'm actually exhausted, but I just didn't, did not want to leave a wide of a gap between the last session that we had on Tuesday and the one following that so i had to do it today so but I'm, i am a bit exhausted um but yeah let's 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 since we're here let's 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 get it done to the best of our abilities as we possibly can so we are going to look at uh the australian dollar and we are going to just do a, a quick analysis, a uh, fundamental analysis, of course, of the Australian dollar for today. And then tomorrow, we're also going to have another session, and we are going to do a quick analysis of another economy, <clears throat> of which in that case, it will be economy that I'll be looking to possibly take the opposite direction to the, to the conclusion that I'll get to for AUD, right, or for the Australian economy. So without any further ado, let's go to trading economics. Trading economics. And then we can start looking at uh, the Australian economy. So as, as usual, we go to forecasts, we go to countries. And then in this case, we'll look at Australia. Uh, G20. Okay, yeah, Australia. Okay, so we'll just look at the currency first. <clears throat> so just a quick read here. Uh, the Australian dollar held below 0 0.695, pressured by hawkish signals from Fed officials who reiterated their commitment to bring down inflation with more rate increases. Still, the currency remains supported by expectations that the Reserve Bank of Australia will tighten policy further. The Reserve Bank of Australia's latest monetary policy statement showed that the central bank revised its inflation forecasts higher for this year, saying price pressures were spreading into services and wages. Okay. Uh, and then the statement suggests two more rate hikes in the coming months and possibly a third one if inflation remains high. Earlier this month, the Reserve Bank of Australia delivered a widely expected 25 basis point increase, lifting the cash rate by an aggregate of three to five basis points since May 2022 and bringing borrowing costs to a 10-year high of 3.35, right? So that's just a summary. It gives us an idea of what the story is from the... Yeah, for, 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 for the Australian economy. And then if we just break down before, okay, yeah, well, let, let us actually start with, with the actual uh, central bank statement, right? Like, like the same way that we did uh, when we we're doing those first two master classes or the second one, uh, let us look at the, 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 the central bank statement. So let's actually go to the website. So the Reserve Bank of Australia, we could have also read this one here, of which it, it's a summarized version of it, of course, but it gives all the important details. But for the sake of learning, uh, let us let us do it. Let us get it directly from, from the actual uh, from the actual uh, bank, uh, or the Reserve Bank of Australia's website, right? So let us look at statement on monetary policy. Conditions, supply and demand drivers. 
Okay, let's go, let's go to what should be under publications. Okay, this is a very elaborated one. So publications or media releases. Okay, let's look at the overview. This should probably be the shorter version of it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, global inflation is still very high, but looks to have peaked. Global goods inflation is starting to decline as supply chains improve and other upstream cost pressures ease. Global energy prices have also stopped rising. However, services inflation remains high in many advanced economies, driven by resilient demand and rising labor costs. Most central banks have continued raising policy interest rates in order to return inflation to target. As tighter policy takes hold on demand, services inflation should also begin to ease. China's approach to containing COVID-19 was reversed abrupt, uh, sorry, abrupt, abruptly in mid-December. The disruptions from the last phase of restrictions in November and the wave of illness in the following month led to weak activity in the December quarter. Since then, though, the Chinese economy has recovered quickly, together with the Chinese authorities' shift to a more growth-focused policy stance. The earlier opening of the Chinese economy has brought forward its recovery from what had previously been expected. This has added sorry, growth in global demand in the near term, especially for some industrial commodities, and so is supporting Australia's terms of trade and national income. That statement is self-explanatory, straightforward of what to expect, right? As China's, China's reopening, it is what it is also supporting Australia's terms of trade and national income. So what does that mean for Australia? That's a positive for Australia, right? So there we first we're getting some 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 positive, something positive for Australia. And then, as is the case elsewhere. Inflation in Australia is too high and, and is broadly based. CPI inflation reached 7.8% over the year to the December quarter. Trimmed mean inflation was 6.9% over the same period, which was higher than had been expected. The easing in global goods price pressures is not yet evident in retail prices here. Consumer durable price inflation picked up in, December, in the December quarter, <clears throat> sorry, especially for clothing and vehicles. Services inflation also reached very high rates with the prices of market services 7% higher over the year. Rental markets are tight and growth in rents has been picking up, right? So that means that in a nutshell, inflation is still high, still persistently high, right? Inflation is likely to have peaked, <clears throat> sorry, around the end of 2022 and is forecast to return to the target range over coming years. The central forecast is for CPI inflation to decline to four and, and a quarter or four and three quarter uh, percent over 2023. So it's, and to around 3% by mid 2025, right? So 2023, it is expected to be above 4% of which the target band for the Reserve Bank of Australia is two to 3% for inflation. That is where the, the central bank is, is happy with inflation being, uh, and then, they expect it to be around four or above 4% 4 in 2023, and then to be um, around 3% by mid 2025, not mid 2024, mid 2025, right? So that they, they still, they're giving themselves a, a, a bit of room, right? Uh, so that they allow the full effects of, of, of interest rate hikes to, 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 to take effect, right? So then to continue, <clears throat> The easing in global price pressures already or 
and pressures already underway is expected to flow through to domestic prices over time. In addition, slower growth in domestic demand and a moderation in labor market conditions are expected to reduce domestic inflationary pressures. The inflation forecasts have been revised up a little in the short term in light of recent stronger outcomes, but further out, inflation is expected to be a touch lower than previously forecast. This reflects recent policy changes that have reduced the size of the expected increases in domestic electricity prices over 2023. So what are we getting here from this, from this, um, these from this uh, sorry paragraph. So essentially, inflation is still high. It expected to remain well above the target in 2023 and also potentially, possibly in 2024. And then around mid 2025, it is expected to drop to 3%. So this is, remember, this is not written in stone. So it can change. So we just need to keep this in the back of our mind and we need to keep viewing um, or, or, or keep paying attention to incoming data, especially when it comes to inflation in Australia. And also in the previous paragraph, they had said that they believe that uh, inflation had peaked, or sorry, in this actual paragraph, inflation is likely to have peaked around the end of 2022. And that is that is where inflation is sitting at around 7.8%. We're still gonna get onto the, into the data, uh, but for now, we're just reading the statement and trying to Get a sense of what the central bank or where or where they stand and where their view is right so and then they also have revised the, their their inflation forecasts up a little in the short term what does that tell us that they they viewing that inflation is going to be persistently high so what does that mean for the central bank their fight against inflation is not yet over and how do they need to continue fighting by continued interest rate hikes. Does that mean that they need to now step up from 0.25% or 25 basis point to 50 or 75 basis point? I don't know, but that is where incoming data will be directing us, right? So, but for now we know that inflation is expected to be persistently high. So it means that the central bank will continue hiking interest rates, right? And then this one, growth inactivity, Growth in activity has moderated since the first half of 2022, and the outlook continues to be for slower GDP growth this year and next at around 1.5%. Some of this moderation occurred as the strong recovery for the, from the pandemic mostly ran its course. The effects of higher interest rates, the rapidly increasing cost of living, and declining real wealth are all expected to weigh on demand in the period ahead. Of setting this to some extent, the elevated terms of trade will boost national income, right? The large pipeline of investment projects is also supportive of growth. However, despite some easing in supply chain issues, ongoing capacity constraints, especially those arising from the lack of availability of skilled labor, are expected to limit the pace at which some of these projects can be delivered. So essentially here, expected growth is expected to slow, of which it makes sense if they're hiking interest rates, you should expect growth to slow. But then there is also a boost that is expected from what? From the trade, uh, from the terms of trade side of things. Like we read in, in one of the paragraphs earlier, China reopening is going to be a positive for Australia, right? So that could obviously boost um, national income. And then the labor market remains tight. The unemployment rate has remained around 3.5% in the recent months, around the lowest rate in nearly 50 years. Broader measures of labor underutilization are also around multi-decade lows. Uh, job ads and vacancy, and vacancy rates remain very high, though they have turned down a little in recent months. Still many firms report difficulty finding suitable labor. Demand for labor remains strong, supporting growth in employment in recent months. Labor supply has expanded to meet some of the, of the strength in demand with the participation rate around its historical high. Increased net arrivals from overseas over the second half of last year, following the reopening of the international border has also boosted growth in the working age population. So pretty straightforward here as well. Uh, labor market remains tight. Uh, even though supply is catching up to demand, uh, but we still, firms are still finding it what, or finding difficulty, uh, with many firms report difficulty finding suitable labor, right? So they still struggle there in this, it, 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 as well. So which means that 
unemployment is not on the rise rapidly, uh, of which that could, that, how can I put it? That, that should also be beneficial to the central bank taking a stance of continued interest rate hikes, right? So that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. And then wages growth has picked up particularly in the private sector, consistent with the tight labor market. Aggregate wages growth is expected to pick up further over the course of 2023, with growth in the wage price index forecast to peak at around four and a half and a quarter percent late in the year. As growth in the economy slows, labor market conditions are expected to ease and wages growth to slow a little. The unemployment rate is expected to start picking up from around the middle of 2023, reaching four and a half percent by mid 2025, right? So that is, those are expectations, unemployment rate to go higher. Uh, and if we do not see that, that will mean what? That the labor market is still strong. And then of course, more rate hikes, as long as also inflation keeps surprising to the upside, right? But also something to take away here is that wage growth has picked up. How does wage growth uh, affect inflation? Okay, so if, if, if wages go higher, then that means that company profits or margins or profit margins from companies is squeezed, right? Because wages are an expense to companies, right? So because they need to pay you as the employee or to pay anyone as the employee, they need to, that is an expense to the what? To the business or to the company. So if they now increase their, their expense, which is wages, that means that where do they need to offset that increase from their profits, right? So it's now eating into their profits. So if it's into eating into the business's profits or the company's profits, how does the company mitigate that? They then raise their prices. And if they raise them, and if the company raises their prices, that is inflation essentially. So in a nutshell, that is how inflation, that is how wage increase contributes to what? To an increase in inflation, right? So yeah. I hope that makes sense. And then growth in household spending moderated over the second half of 2022. Spending related uh, to overseas travel rose sharply, uh, but other categories such as discretionary goods uh, were softer as the recovery from the pandemic mostly ran its course. The tight labor market and resulting uh, strong growth in labor income has to date supported solid growth in nominal household spending. However, real growth in consumption has been much lower, reflecting strong growth in prices. The volume of retail sales declined in the December quarter. Then over the period ahead, high inflation is expected to continue to weigh on growth in real household incomes and consumption. Rising interest rates are expected to add to this effect by reducing real disposable income for some households. So just a, just also what we discussed in our first uh, lesson or masterclass in terms of high interest rates, uh, they are supposed to reduce what real disposable income for households and then that will ultimately result in what's in dampening or slow down in, in, in the demand of goods and services. And then so declines in net wealth driven by lower housing prices are also expected to dampen household spending housing prices have continued to decline across most of the country over recent months. Then the competing forces influencing household spending represent a considerable uncertainty surrounding the outlook. Consumption growth could turn out to be either stronger or weaker than expected, depending on how these factors net out. It is not clear how far households will be, will be willing to reduce current saving rates or draw down on extra savings accumulated during the pandemic to cushion consumption from the effects of declining real incomes. These accumulated buffers represent a larger share of household income in Australia than in some other countries, but some households have little to no buffer and will, stay, will instead look to cut back on spending, of which then that should support the whole narrative of trying to slow down the demand of goods and services if, if households start to cut back on spending. The forecast decline in inflation is subject to a number of uncertainties. Although goods inflation is expected to ease in line with the easing of global cost pressures, the timing and pace of this could differ from the expected trajectory. If global goods prices reversed, some of their recent increases, goods inflation in Australia could decline further and faster than currently envisaged. Then working in the other direction, 
given the current tightness in the labor market, there are upside risks to wage growth. I just explained wages, and here you're getting the statement, there are upside risks to wage growth, which would boost domestically sourced inflation. Price and wage setting behavior could become more sensitive to strong demand and high inflation, given that households and firms may be more attentive to rising costs when inflation is high for a time. Longer term inflation expectations remain anchored, but it is possible they could move higher. If that were to occur, it would make the task of bringing inflation down harder. Then global growth slowed during 2022. Some of this reflected the end of the bounce back from the pandemic. However, as in Australia, high inflation and energy prices have weighed on demand more recently. Growth in Australia's major trading partners is expected to remain well below the historical average over 2023 and 2024. Some downside risks to growth in the major global economies have abated of late, including those stemming from China's previous approach to containing COVID-19. Overall, though, the global outlook remains uncertain, with there being plausible scenarios for both stronger and weaker growth and inflation. The cumulative effect of synchronized tightening in monetary policy has caused global financial conditions to tighten over the past year, reducing demand in the global economy. This is expected to be the main drag on the global growth in the period ahead. Many central banks have begun to slow the pace of interest rate increases as signs of moderation in growth and inflation emerge. And a few have paused rate rises or signal they will soon do so. In Australia, tighter financial conditions have seen banks funding costs increase and growth in credit ease. The Australian dollar has appreciated slightly on a trade weighted basis over recent months. Over recent meetings, the Reserve Bank uh, Board uh, has continued to take action to ensure inflation which returns to target to the target range over time and raised interest rates by 25 basis points at each of its meeting in December and February. This has been necessary to achieve a better balance of supply and demand in the Australian economy and prevent high inflation from becoming entrenched. The board is seeking to return inflation to its 2 to 3% target range while keeping the economy on an even keel. However, the path to achieving a soft landing remains narrow. There are considerable uncertainties surrounding the outlook and so around the level of interest rates needed to achieve the board's objective. Which objective? Getting back to 2 to 3%. Maintaining a steady pace of increases over several months has given the board the time to assess the flow of incoming data and any shifts to the outlook that it, it may uh, imply. Longer term inflation expectations and wage growth in Australia have so far remained consistent with the inflation target. It is important to remain, this remains the case. That said, domestically sourced inflation and wages growth are both picking up. Given the importance of avoiding a price wage spiral, the board will continue to pay, to play, to pay close attention to both the price setting behavior of firms and the evolution of labor costs in the period ahead. It will be closely monitoring how quickly declines in global costs are passed through to prices by businesses in Australia. The board is mindful that a considerable adjustment to interest rates has already been made and that monetary policy affects activity and inflation with the lag and through different channels. The effects on the cash flow of the roughly one third of households with mortgages generally comes through faster than the effects on the broader economy and inflation. The effects on the households are also uneven. Some households have substantial saving buffers or are benefiting from the tight labor market and faster wage growth. Others though are experiencing a painful squeeze on their budgets due to higher interest rates and the rising cost of living. In addition, some households may moderate their spending in response to the decline in housing prices. In light of these competing forces, the board is closely monitoring house, household spending and saving behavior and their contribution to domestic demand pressures. The board's priority is to return inflation to target. High inflation makes life difficult for people and damages the functioning of the economy. And if inflation were to become entrenched in people's expectations, it would be very costly to reduce later. The board expects that further in increase in interest rates will be needed to ensure that, that, that the current period of high inflation is only temporary. In assessing how much further interest rates need to increase, excuse me, the board will be paying close attention to developments in the global economy, trends in household spending, 
and the outlook for inflation and the labor market. So four things. It remains resolute in its determination to return inflation to target and will do what is necessary to achieve this. Oh, that was long. Whew, that was long, yeah. <laughs> that was long. So that is the story that we're getting from Australia. So benefiting from, from uh, China reopening and also inflation is expected to be higher in the short term. And they also expect the uh, old labor market is also tight. And then they also expect slower growth, but uh, also a boost from, from, the, from the national income in terms of, uh, terms of trade with China that could also support what the, the Australian economy. So I'm, I'm getting a positive uh, shift or a positive bias uh, on the Australian dollar just by reading that. That is where I'm leaning towards, right? But let's 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 read more to 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 add more to to our thesis to see if whether it passes the test or does data actually support the narrative, right? So uh, I won't really be reading much on this. Okay, it's a summarized version. So the Reserve Bank of Australia raised the cash rate by two, 25 basis point to 3.35 at its February meeting, matching market forecast. Tuesday's move was the ninth rate hike since May last year, which brought borrowing costs to a level last seen in September 2012. The total three to five increases also masked, masked, marked, sorry, uh, I've done a lot of reading now, <laughs> marked the sharpest annual tightening since 1989. While dropping the previous guidance of the uh, of unpreset part, the board reiterated further hikes would be needed as inflation in Australia remained too high. The central bank seeks to return inflation to 2 to 3% range and projects the reading to come in at above 4% this year, around 3% by mid-2025. So policymakers mentioned they would keep the economy on an even keel since the way to achieve a soft landing is a narrow one. The community forecasts Australia's GDP growth to average 1.5% in 2023 and 2024 after expanding largely or after expanding largely in 2022. The RPA also raised the interest rate uh, on exchange settlement balances by 25 basis point to 3.25%, 3, 3 right? So like I said, this is just a summary of all that we've read, but I highly recommend that you read the long part uh, before, and before actually reading the summary or just ignore the summary altogether. Or once you're familiar, you familiarize yourself, you understand what the central bank is looking at or looking for, then you can just read all these summer, this, this shorter version or summarized version to just have an understanding of what is happening, right? So let us continue, right? So let us now look at the data for Australia. Like I said, I'm tilting more towards being bullish on, on the Australian economy. Uh, so let us, yeah, let us look at some of the data. So let's start with GDP growth rate. Uh, it's a lagging indicator, but, uh, it's worth, it's worth paying attention to. So you can see that uh, I'd say it's it's flat, right? And when it comes to GDP, it's flat. Uh, we've seen it pick up from 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 back to 0 0.6, right? So it can go either way. It can either show a decline, maybe even into the negative territory, but for now it's still flat. Not much when it comes to GDP, right? And then if we go into the labor, let us look at employed persons. Uh, to see if is that is that tracking higher okay you can see that has been tracking higher sort of like moderated uh, in in December but it has been tracking higher and then if we look at unemployed persons has that been decreasing okay so that has been decreasing and then now it's starting to pick up right so maybe there might be some cracks in the labor market uh, as, as as interest rates keep going higher and higher uh, but it's something to also pay attention to, right? And then let us look at the, the actual unemployment rate. And then if you see, okay, you can obviously read this. This will give you more details, right? In terms of the nuances or the details. But for the sake of the video, like I said, I don't want to keep it long because I am a bit tired. So I just want to just look at the chart, look at the trend, look at the data, right? So as you can see within with the... 
unemployment, it started starting to pick up from 3.4 to 3.5. Remember, they're expecting it to climb up to about 4%. I think that's also in 2025 or mid 2025, if I'm not mistaken, uh, based on the statement, right? So, so I'd say I'd say it's also flat. Yeah, it's also flat. Remember, it's around 50 year lows, so it's still in a not in a bad position at all. Uh, let us see pre-pandemic. This was pre-pandemic, right? 2020, uh, it shot up, right? And then we way below even the pre-pandemic level. So yeah, it's quite tight. It's quite tight, right? It might seem as if it's picking up if we're looking at a one year because from 3.4 to 3.5, but on a bigger scheme of things, you can see that it's quite low. It's quite, quite low. So that is what we have from the labor market. So the labor market, based on what I'm seeing, it could also support uh, further interest rate increases. Does it mean it can support a 0.75% or 75 basis point hike? I don't know, but there's still more room to, to, to hike, right? And then if you look at prices, which is inflation, let us look at core inflation rate. Remember, the target band is 2 to 3%. And inflation has just been surprising, higher and higher and higher and higher every month, higher reading to the previous month, right? So what is that telling us? Inflation is still persistent. This is core inflation. Let us look at headline inflation. Uh, inflation rate. Are we getting the same vibes? Uh, of course, we're getting the same vibes. It has been picking up month after month. So inflation is sticky. Inflation is persistent. And remember, the central bank said they what? They committed to doing what? To bring inflation down. So the board's priority, uh, excuse me, guys, sorry. The board's priority, very strong word, priority is to return inflation to target. And how will they achieve that? By obviously what? Hiking interest rates. That is the only way they can achieve it, especially if there is no sign that interest rates is the sort of that inflation is slowing down. Because for most economies, inflation has been slowing since around November, October last year, right? So for but for Australia, it's still climbing and climbing. So what does that mean? Possibly more interest rate hikes coming. And then now we also have we'll have this inflow of, of, of growth that might come from the side of China. And that will also boost what global demand. If it boosts global demand, that will also increase the demand for energy. And if it does that, that could also feed into inflation. If it also feeds into inflation, it could also result in inflation in Australia being more persistently higher. And then they would have to hike more in terms of interest rates, right? And maybe the economy will be able to handle that because they would have that uh, national income boost from the what from the terms of trade with China. So that is where my thinking is when it comes to Australia. And that is why I said initially I'm tilting bullish and more the more I'm, I'm digging deeper into the data, from my standpoint, it is supporting that narrative for now. Uh, let us look at inflation on a monthly. Uh, so inflation rate monthly, uh, it's, yeah, it's picked up and then we'd say it's sort of moderating or it's flat right now, but it's also, this is on a monthly change, right? And it's close to the two to 3% target band. So yeah, I feel that inflation is quite sticky at the moment. And then if you look at money, of course, in pretty much interest rates here, yeah? uh, we've seen them go up and yeah, they're still going up. And then if you look at uh government side you can look at okay government budget pretty much most most uh most uh, economies uh they showing a deficit uh which means that the government is spending more than well the output is more than the input essentially that that's what it means right uh and then uh let us go into business right let us look at some pmi data let us look at uh what is this PMIs? Let's look at manufacturing PMIs. You can see that they've actually been slowing down, currently sitting at 44.7, sharp decline from slightly below 50 to now sitting at 44.7. So PMIs have been slowing, of which that could signal that in the near future, uh, we would probably see what see a slowdown in the Australian economy, right? Because uh, remember, PMIs are more of a leading indicator. Then if we look at services, you can also see it has been slowing down as well. 
So also telling us the same story, right? That growth will eventually slow in the U in the in the Australian economy. And then if we look at uh, consumer, let us look at consumer confidence. You can see that it has been declining and it's sort of picking up slightly, right? So for the past two months, it has been surprising to the upside. So maybe we should see if a trend is developing there. Uh, but for now, I'd say data supports that, that bullish narrative, right? Or maybe I'm just being biased, but I feel that it is, uh, especially based on after reading the central bank statement, right? And then if we go on to uh, disposable uh, personal income, we can see that that has also been picking up. And we also got that, of course, from the statement as well, right? So not really much there. And then if we go to, yeah, that's pretty much it there. I won't really go into housing. So based on that, I feel that uh, the Australian economy is supported. Um, it is supported enough in terms of uh, the data supports the bullish narrative uh, from, from the Australian dollar, right? So that is where I stand and that is why I'll be looking to by the Australian dollar. I'm more tilting on being bullish on the Australian dollar. Like I said, inflation has been surprising to the upside every single month. Um, we've, see, we've seen with other economies, inflation has been slowing down. Even some central banks have even start, have even paused or even considered pausing. We read all of that from the statement. So this is just going through the data is just trying to see if the data supports that narrative, right? And remember all those projections that they made, these expecting growth to slow, inflation to pick up. So we also need to keep following data and have those numbers at the back of our mind, right? They're also expecting wage growth or wages to push higher. So that is definitely going to feed into inflation as well. And how do they fight inflation if their priority is to make sure that, uh, it, that to make sure that inflation returns to target? they need to hike more, right? So I feel that Australia will start picking up in terms of hikes, not to say that they'll start hiking by one, by 100 basis points or 75 basis points, but I feel that they will eventually, if inflation continues to be sticky, they'll start ramping up the pace or even continue for longer in terms of hiking interest rates, while all the other economies are either slowing down or pausing to see and assess the situation, right? And then I feel also with the surge uh, or with the sorry with the <clears throat> sorry with the transfer of growth from china or that boost from china then that could also put the australian economy in terms of growth in a good position to withstand those further interest rate hikes and then hopefully fight inflation right uh, so yeah okay so guys, uh, okay, something just popped up on my screen that participants can now see my application. Uh, just let me know if, were you not seeing my screen all this time? Just let me know. Yeah. Um... Sure, Sanel, we actually yeah. were seeing a screen. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was about to say after talking so much. Okay. <laughs> no, no, it's cool. It's cool. Oh, wait, so oh, uh so yeah, in terms in terms of uh in terms of the Australian economy, that's where I stand. You can even look at the forecast here. You can clearly see GDP is expected to slow inflation on a monthly is also expected to slow eventually, also headline inflation. But based on the data that we currently have, it has been pushing high. It has been surprising to the upside. And that is why I'm expecting to or anticipating a, a further hike or a continued hike in interest rates from the um, Bank of Australia or the Reserve Bank of Australia, right? So yeah, that pretty much wraps it up for, for my uh, analysis on Australia, of course. I can go into more data, read more articles on the chi on the Chinese reopening, see some supporting data. I can even go into China here in terms of countries forecast, go into China. Um, let us actually do that. Because pretty much for Australia, 
I would say it is dependent on China's uh, reopening, right? Even though inflation is obviously persistent and that will require the central bank to continue hiking, but more of that expected growth in the Australian economy is dependent on China's reopening, right? So even if we can, we can read here, it uh, the off year, the offshore yen, uh, yen sorry, traded um, around 6.8 per dollar, hovering near its weakest levels in a month, as stronger than expected US jobs data suggested. Fed had more room for interest rate hikes. Investors also monitored simmering tensions after the US military shot down a suspected Chinese spy balloon over the Atlantic Ocean. Meanwhile, official data showed Chinese private sector activity rebounded sharply and turned expansionary in January. The country also posted robust holiday spending and tourism data during the week-long Lunar New Year celebrations. Moreover, Beijing vowed to promote consumption as a major economic driver and to boost imports. If they are to boost imports, if they are getting some imports from Australia, then definitely going to benefit Australia, right? On the monetary policy front, the People's Bank of China kept its key lending rates unchanged for the fifth straight month at its January meeting, right? So that's also like a summary, sorry, a summary, but it also gives us an insight, right, on what is happening, what is expected of the Chinese economy. So we can also dig deeper into that, read more articles, but just based on what I've read from the Central the Reserve Bank of Australia's uh, monetary policy statement, and then based on what I've, I got from the data and also after reading this for, for, for the Chinese economy, then that is also supporting the narrative to be bullish on the Australian dollar. And then, like I said, tomorrow I'll be looking or diving deeper into a different economy of which in that economy, like I said, if I'm bullish on the Australian dollar, then that economy I'll be looking to take the opposite side, right? Because I sense that there might be a divergence building between the two economies, right? So that's, that's it for Australia. So uh, if any of you guys have questions, uh, just uh, ask away. I'm handing the floor over to you. Questions or maybe suggestions or anything you'd like to add, uh, or maybe if you something you did not understand, or maybe even if you disagree with me, like no, Sanele, uh, you're bullshitting us. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me know. Okay, um, Sanele, figure late on the on the meeting itself, so. Um, like I understand the the sentiments. Um, China reopening its borders, not necessarily its borders, but the the whole COVID situation and stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand your sentiments, and I do agree with this. Okay, sorry. So it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah, we will also have the recording. Of course, I'll share the recording as well. Uh, and then you can you can just get the first part that you missed. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Was yeah, yeah, no, I will I will do that. Sure. Okay. Uh then Kevin, anything from your side? Okay, I'll take that. He probably dozed off or something. So I'll take that. He he understood whatever I said. <laughs> so uh yeah, now like I said, so for tomorrow, we'll also have another session. I'll try and make it same time as well. Uh and try and keep it shorter, of course, than today's session, right? But uh hopefully it's all making sense because how I how I tried to structure it to structure everything is from the first lesson that we had breaking things down, inflation, interest rates, so on and so forth, and then looking at the central bank and how it all ties in with the data. And then now we actually sort of doing the practical work of actually go breaking down an economy, looking at what could support the economy positively, what could affect the economy negatively, and then actually getting into uh, 
a decision really you're making a decision of whether we long or short that specific economy so that is pretty much what, what we'll be doing and then from there we can move over of course to the technical side once we have a bias on certain economies and then to see if do we have any technical levels where we could possibly get in at a cheaper price if we're looking to buy or at a, an expensive price if we're looking to sell right so yeah that's pretty much it so once again thank you for tuning in and i think we're gonna end the meeting here because uh fundo said you're good kelvin is uh yeah he's good too i know so yeah yeah uh sanele yeah. there's 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 one thing i want to 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 hello yeah i'm still here oh sorry um i just wanted to 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 to, to put in like um like a suggestion for mm -hmm. like probably just another class in the future yeah uh i'm not really sure what about megan john in terms of their accounts and how they manage mm -hmm. risk and yeah. if they do calculate pips or not but that would be like a great insight listen to to how to like manage the account the which lot sizes to use okay. and you just the basics for like risk management or stuff like that yeah, yeah no okay okay no i get you no we'll definitely go into that looking at margin understanding in margin yeah cool uh and what margin fits your account balance and all of that no we'll, we'll definitely yeah. get into that <clears throat> but leo that one will be more of the private that will be more private yeah yeah, yeah. so you would definitely be 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 getting that as well oh yeah yeah uh, but besides that uh everything is not on my side. <laughs> okay okay <laughs> okay uh thanks oh wait so no guys uh we'll catch up tomorrow uh yeah let's say same time as well okay. same time okay. uh, okay. off now for sure oh, yeah yeah cheers cheers <laughs>